The Curse of Strahd recap. It has been quite a year for us here in the land of Barovia. Um, things have gone to hell in a handbasket, I suppose we could call it. Um, however, of course, we would like to start off with thanking our sponsors, D&D Beyond, that is D, the letter N, D, Beyond.com, as well as Lucky Dice Cafe and Station Retro. If you're looking for a live game to play out in the Huntsville, Alabama area in the new year, head on out to those two locations and check on, uh, check out our main DM, Captain Zach. So, without further ado, oh, they started in a festival to celebrate something. They don't remember what it is. It's been so long ago. And they were individually or by happen chance um, called into the tent of a fortune teller. And each of them drew a card. And during that card drawing, they were told a little bit more about the mission that they were all about to partake. When they exited the tent, it was at the base of a hill no longer in the beautiful festival that they had been in, but now truly in the land of Barovia. They were called up to a large house that sits on top of a hill by two ghost children. Once up there, they, well, their cleric, decided to kick the door open in what is now called the Cyrenox fashion. It was kick the door in and ask questions later. And while you kick the door in, make sure that you are yelling for whatever it is in that house to come fight you. They take some time to go through the house, getting to the upper floors, finding out that the children there had starved to death and that there was a monster in the basement. They get down to the basement, are attacked by a few ghasts and ghouls, and then find a mimic posing itself as a door. The cleric got himself stuck, nearly died to the mimic, and then was summarily rescued by the rest of his party. They found the shambling mound in the depths of this house, managed to get themselves out, and just started to run. They got out of the haunted house. And then they found themselves in the village of Barovia. The fog had cleared from the rest of the village, and it allowed them to see. The first person that they met as soon as they got into the tavern was a young man by the name of Ismark the Lesser. Ismark asked them, quite nicely if they would assist him in escorting his sister to the town of Velaki and perhaps even further. They, he believed that his sister would be safe from the advances of Strahd. When the group goes back to the house, um, they meet with this young girl. I say young girl, but I mean she's she can hold her own at the very least. And she greets them into the house along with her brother. Um, and then they spend the night there, during which howling wolves and zombies bash against the side of the house in an attempt to scare the residents inside. As the party moves on to escort this young lady to Velaki, um, they are beset by scarecrows. The party summarily, of course, protects her and moves on. After that, they come across a small encampment of Vistani, where some of them, remembering the kindly old woman who gave them the card reading, was met with again. The bard at the time wished to stay and learn more about their stories and their cultures, so that is what the bard did. She, They stayed with the Vistani, never to be seen again by the party. The party moves on with Ismark and Irina, and 
eventually hits Velaki, where one festival is just wrapped up and the next is being advertised already. During the process of this short stay in Velaki, they had Irina and Ismark safely ensconced in the chapel, or what they thought was safely ensconced in the chapel. And then they go to find out what exactly is going on in this town. Perhaps they can get some help and learn a few of the local myths and legends, as it were. During this time, they found out that some of the townsfolk agreed with the Burgomaster, and others were very much against what the Burgomaster had been doing. In the process of discovering all of this, the blood hunter, Nyx, and the wizard, Krom, who were good friends before this, well, I say good friends, but they had been traveling together for quite some time before this. Um, they both enter with Gwensarda, the party's rogue, um, into the Burgomaster's house to have a talk with the Burgomaster. During such a time, the Burgomaster's right-hand man, Isaac, catches sight of Nyx, who looks very unerringly just like Irina Kuliana. Now, Isaac, not understanding what it is about Nyx, basically kidnaps her, locks her in his room, and then heads back down to be confronted by the rogue and the wizard, both of whom adamantly believed that Nyx was still in the house, despite his assurances that she was not. During the time that she was locked up in that room, she decided she was going to trash it, destroying every single doll, overturning his wardrobe, and just completely decimating that room. Except for one doll, which she kept. A keepsake of the destruction she caused. While here, they meet with this strange fighter named Ophi. And while they travel with Ophi, um, a few other things start to happen. Um, they discover in the chapel that there is a vampire spawn locked in the basement who is the son of the priest, because the priest does not know what to do to save his son. However, once you are a vampire spawn, there is no saving you, except through the sweet release of death. And that is what the party does. They kill the vampire spawn, who is crying out for his father to feed him from underneath the, the chapel. During this time, Strahd shows up, and leaves a peculiar calling card for the party. Coffins to everybody's size with their names on them. In addition to this, they go to the Burgomaster and talk with him to find out that... Sorry, apologies. They did not go talk with the Burgomaster. They snuck into the Burgomaster's house in the stealth of the morning to kill him. As most of the town, as they have found out, were not too excited about the Burgomaster and his belief that if they just believed that everything would be well and were joyful and happy, then everything would be. The party, unable to come to a reasonable determination and killed both the burgomaster and his wife and then ran upstairs into the attic where they heard scuffles with Ophi. Ophi had found the son who immediately had escaped through a teleportation circle. The teleportation circle was not complete. He was not a high enough level wizard to be able to use it properly and he wound up dead on the other side. It is here that Nyx found a small skeletal cat that she adopted and called Poppy. As they realized that Velaki was no more safe for Irina and Ismark than um, Barovia was, they moved on to Kresk. When they arrived at Kresk, 
it was to find out that they would not be admitted entry unless they were able to help the town with, well, a wine problem. Their wine shipment was very much delayed, and they weren't sure why, but they weren't going to leave the town undefended to go find out. So the party, in exchange for going to do this task, got Irina and Ismark into the uh, into the town without a problem. They then turn and head down to the Wizards of Wine, where they are assaulted by twig blights, vine blights, and tree blights? I honestly don't remember if there were tree blights. I don't think there were. But anyway, I digress. They manage to get into the Wizards of Wine, rescue the family that was there, and then found a book. Not only written in common, but also written in a strange dialect called Vampire. Nyx, able to read the entirety of the thing, learns more about Strahd but only tells the party some. During their travels in the middle of the night, if Nyx was keeping watch, Strahd would come and visit her. He had taken a particular interest in her, just like Ismark had. Er, sorry, Isaac had. It is without doubt, as they travel on to find one of the seeds that have been stolen, from the Wizards of Wine, that things could get dangerous and get dangerous fast. And this was no more a true fact than when they arrived at the... at Yester Hill, where they found a Gulthus tree, which was spawning all of these twig blights and vine blights and whatnot, that... Things could go bad and go bad very quickly as they were beset by berserkers and marauders, as well as some druids. They were able to summarily dispatch them, and Strahd showed up a short time later to inspect the effigy in front of him that was made of him. He talked for some time to the party that was there with Crumb off and attempting to chop down the Gulthus tree. The party, well, sorry, Cyrenox, decided that in his infinite wisdom that it would be the best possible idea to haul back and hit Strahd. Strahd, being the gracious host that he is, leaves them with a letter inviting them to dinner despite the violent actions taken against him. The party returns the seed to the Wizards of Wine and then head back to Kresk to get entry into the, the town. They head up to the abbey where the abbot is keeping Ismark and Irina safe. Irina decides that she would like to go for a walk, and does so, with Gwensarda and their artificer Yalakin in tow. As they walk down, they come across a pool where Irina's true nature, as the reincarnation of Titania, comes to light. She is joined together with her lover, Sergei, the man that she loved dearly more than she had ever loved Strahd, given that she did not love Strahd at all. And she is reunited with him, despite Yalakin and Gwensarda's best attempts. Strahd, knowing that Irina was no longer part of this world, destroyed the reflecting pool in Kresk. And then... As the party reconvened, a figure bursts into the dining hall. As they do, Ophi services here in Barovia are no longer needed. Standing before them is a tiefling who has been stuck in Barovia for 60 years. Taekadal, 
a former paladin of redemption, is now a paladin of vengeance. She travels with the party, slowly gaining their trust. And on their way to the Amber Temple, they are asked to deal with a small werewolf problem. They manage to do so and assist with the displacement of the current alpha, um, leaving the former alpha's wife in charge. It is during this time that the ally that they had found in Casimir speaks up and lets them know that they should probably head to Strahd's castle and accept his invitation for dinner. Not because he trusts the man, but because if they don't, it could spell out worse trouble for them later on. The party, deciding that one, now that they have cleared out this werewolf issue, have decided that yes, they will go to Castle Ravenloft for the first time. A black carriage with horse, horses drawing it arrives to take them to the castle. They are allowed to explore, although there are some areas that are blocked off from them. Um, some due to renovations, some due to the preparations for the party that will happen the next day at the castle. The next day, Strahd holds a All Hallows Eve party in his castle in the Grand... Um, sorry, in the throne room where he would normally conduct business. It had been turned into a ballroom for the occasion. During this time, the party sees members of their lives that they may not have seen in a very long time. Nix's mothers arrive. They're the last of the groups to arrive. And it is then that Nix and Crom realize that they are related Krom is one of Gria's clanmates, and Nyx is Gria's daughter. It leads for some hilarity as that happens. And there are others that just enjoy the night. It is a splendid affair. As the night goes on, Strahd, of course, dances with every single member of the party, male or female. He ends with a drinking contest against Cyrenox, to which he wins, but not without having to go through quite a substantial amount of alcohol. That morning, at dawn, he pulls the young girl that has been living at his castle up to the top of the podium, and after all of his guests have left except for the party, he looks at them, grins, and informs them that despite the fact that he had been deceiving them, the others at the party, that he was not a vampire. It did not matter, because that is exactly what he is. And in front of the party, he drains this girl of all the blood she has and then summarily informs the party that if he catches them in his castle after they have slept, he could not guarantee their safety any longer. The party, having been to Argen Vashtholt and learned about where the dragon skull has been kept, had used their time exploring the castle wisely. They managed to get the skull out of Castle Ravenloft. Not only do they get it out of Castle Ravenloft, but they get it properly ensconced back in the mausoleum of Argen Vashtol. This allows them, well, somewhat of a boon. Some of them get the boon, some of them don't. And then they proceed on to the Amber Temple. The Amber Temple sits high up in the mountains, and it is cold, so very cold. They enter the Amber Temple and are immediately assaulted by a man who is guarding it. Casimir slips off into the shadows as the party retreats to a safe room off to the side. As the party retreats and explores a little bit more with the safety of walls between them and their attacker, Casimir arrives 
with an amber golem chasing after him, blood covering his clothing. He promises it's not his, but as the party takes care of the amber golem, it is clear that he had taken some damage. From then on, it was a lengthy exploration of the cast of the, the temple, finding other combatants and traps and pitfalls, even going so far as to finding a lich who could no longer remember what his name was or what his spells were. A few restoration spells later, they were able to restore his name, his memories, and his spells to him. He walks through the Amber Temple with them, talking to Krom, telling him of all the knowledge that he would be able to impart to this man so that he would be able to become one of the most powerful wizards in the world. Krom, immediately intrigued by this proposition, takes on the dark gift of lichdom when it is presented to him. The party, in and of themselves, each investigate a different sarcophagus of amber, and encased inside of each is a dark gift and a dark being. These dark beings will give them gifts in exchange for flaws or deformities or a negative trade-off. Most of the party takes a gift. The only two who do not are Tyekadal and Yalakin. Cyrenox only takes one, and it is the power to resurrect somebody, regardless of how long they've been dead. Casimir takes that gift, as they are going to head into Castle Ravenloft to find his sister and bring her back. It is without a doubt a tough go. Um, they managed to get back down off of the mountain and to Argon Vashtor, where Cyrenox, after the parties had had some deliberation about it, um, Cyrenox decides that reviving the silver dragon that they had properly esconded in his burial chamber was the best course of action. He does so during which um, it takes a good hour, hour and a half to resurrect him because he has been dead for so many centuries. He is not impressed when he comes back to life. He knows that he had been dead for much too long. And that meant, of course, that somebody had taken a dark gift to bring him back. This means, of course, that he is already uninclined to assist the party and when he finds out due to the paladin letting him know that 90 percent of the party had decided to take gifts dark gifts of their own he flatly refused to help them at all unable to have yet another ally in their fight against strahd the party treaches tr the party moves on to castle ravenloft as they enter into castle ravenloft piddlewick a gift given to Nyx from the first time that they had stayed in Castle Ravenloft leads them safely through the castle, through the back entrances. Well, as safe as one can be given that they are going through Castle Ravenloft, which is sometimes looking to kill them. They eventually make it down into the catacombs after a few winding turns and the DM unable to find a very safe path because this is something Piddlewick would know, but Castle Ravenloft is a maze. Um, we find them in the catacombs. They find Strahd's tomb. They found Sergei's tomb. They have found what they can assume to be King and Queen Barov's tomb. And after vanquishing Strahd's three brides, reviving Petrina, Casimir's sister, the party is left with a decision. Do we stay in Strahd's tomb and use Leoman's tiny hut, or do we find a safer place within a castle that wishes to kill them to rest for the evening? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where we will pick up on January one moment. On January 9th, with the party coming back to that decision. We have maybe two or three episodes left of Curse of Strahd. 
then we will have a short two-week break while we prepare for the next campaign, which will be Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, as I take this party from the demi-plains of despair right into the nine circles of hell. As always, ladies and gentlemen, I am Pick Rambo, and I am the DM for Thursday Nights. Be good to one another, and remember, roar for initiative.